Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. San Antonio ISD, the first school district to announce that teachers and staff must be vaccinated against COVID-19. The district notifying staff in a letter saying their deadline to get that shot is October 15th. In that letter, school officials say they believe the best way to protect students and others from COVID-19 is by getting as many people vaccinated as possible. Also noted in that letter that 90% of SAISD staff is already Ready, fully vaccinated, but now that last 10% will be required to get the shot. District officials reminding staff it takes five weeks to reach full protection after getting that first dose. Not mentioned, though, what will happen to those who are not vaccinated by that deadline. Meanwhile, SAISD also will require masks for students and staff in compliance of Bear County's mask mandate, which is back in place following an injunction hearing today. 56, uh, 57th Civil District Court Judge Antonia Ortega again ruling in favor of the city and county. This legal battle has gone back and forth as the Texas Supreme Court yesterday sided with Governor Greg Abbott over the temporary restraining order put in place last week. Masks are mandated for schools, city and county employees, and all those entering county and city, uh, city facilities. This ruling is not the end of this battle as appeals will likely be filed. Here's what local leaders have to say about today's ruling. We do realize that the battle is not over. We expect the state to appeal the judge's decision and we'll be there to defend our school children every step of the way. What's different now from last year is that we have 1,600 less hospital employees to deal with. So as she said, even though you may see a hospital bed, even though you may have a ventilator, if you don't have the personnel to care for these individuals, that's the real problem. And this current COVID wave is taking a toll on pediatric health care workers. Yeah, from teens to children under the age of one, they have been treated at co for COVID at University Hospital. Our Tiffany Huerta spoke to a nurse working in the pediatric ICU about what he is seeing on the front lines. It's very heartbreaking. Rudy Martinez, a registered nurse at University Hospital's pediatric ICU, says it's been difficult watching kids suffer from COVID-19. Kids who are having fevers of like 103 to 104, you're talking about weakness, shortness of breath, difficult breathing. Ages range from teens to infants. They're healthy kids who were probably doing a normal day stuff, having fun with their friends and going out and playing and stuff like that, who actually can't breathe in some ways and who are having a lot of anxiety They've had patients as young as six months old hospitalized with COVID. In the past, we saw patients who were asymptomatic coming in and they were just getting a swab and they happened to be COVID positive. But now we're actually seeing patients come in with COVID itself, like COVID symptoms. Martina says they are prescribing breathing treatments and medication, but hospitals are also treating kids for RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, a common cause of cold-like symptoms, but can be serious for infants and the elderly. So we think maybe the fact that last year we didn't see it as much because everybody was wearing a mask and this year we're starting to see it once the mask uh, mandate came down. Martinez is concerned if we continue on this path. I think it's going to cause a big strain on the hospital itself, on our pediatric floors. The CDC says everyone 12 years and older should get a COVID-19 vaccination to help protect against COVID-19. Martinez says there are ways to keep children safe. Wearing masks, keeping a distance, using hand sanitizer, washing your hands, being aware of the things you do in the community itself. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Today, another Bear County judge invalidating an executive order keeping inmates from being released. It was brought into question during one woman's case. Janie Valeda was sentenced to a year in prison on a misdemeanor assault charge. Due to good behavior, she should have been released early, but she couldn't be released due to Governor Abbott's order. Judge Ron Renhell set her bond at $1 so she could get out of jail, and he's ruled the executive order is unconstitutional. The order was issued in March of 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. Another big story we're following tonight, San Antonio police making an arrest in connection with the shooting outside of a sports bar that left three people dead on Sunday. 34 year old Daniel Berrigan seen here has been charged with three counts of capital murder. The shooting happened just before 3.30 a.m. at the Boom Boom Sports Bar on South New Braunfels Avenue near I-10. Officers say it all started with a fight inside the bar, which then spilled out into the parking lot. 
Police say they arrested Berrigan after he was pulled over for a traffic stop today at the corner of Southwest Military and Curtis. 26 year old Mauro Rodriguez and 32 year old April Rodriguez were killed in that shooting. They were identified to us by family members. The third victim has not yet been identified. Meantime, we now know the identity of a man shot and killed by San Antonio police last Friday. 35 year old Stephen Prim died after shooting an officer, according to SAPD, and leading police on a chase through the city's east side. Police say that chase started when Prim threatened a group of men with a gun in the 4500 block of Lakewood Drive. Police arrived at the scene and Prim took off on his bike and shot an officer twice. At last check, that officer was expected to recover, but Prim died from his injuries. San Antonio police looking for the driver involved in a deadly hit and run late last month over on the city's south side. It happened back on July 28th in the 300 block of Roosevelt Avenue near I-37. Investigators say 51 year old Christine Alex was struck by a car there. She later died at the hospital from her injuries. Investigators are still looking for both the driver and the vehicle involved in the incident, which was a white Dodge Charger. They say the car should have damage on the front right side. If you have any information that could lead to an arrest, call Crime Stoppers, their number 210-224-STOP. Just days after he would have turned 30 years old, the father of a U.S. Army sergeant from San Antonio is reflecting on the role his son played in the ongoing war in Afghanistan. That war would ultimately take his son's life. And now things have taken a sharp, swift turn in that country as the capital city of Kabul has fallen to the Taliban. I don't think his life, his death there was in vain. I believe that he had a purpose. Javier Gutierrez is the father of Sergeant First Class Javier Gutierrez, who was better known by his middle name, Jaguar. It was on February 8th of 2020, Jaguar and fellow Sergeant Antonio Rodriguez made the ultimate sacrifice, ambushed while serving in Afghanistan, a nation now falling to the Taliban in just a matter of days. And I thought about it and I said, Jaguar, would you be turning in your grave right now if you would see what's happening? And I don't think he would. He would say that I did what I needed to do that. I preserved freedom as much as I could with my life. Freedom, at least for those in Afghanistan, now up in the air as Taliban leaders secure the presidential palace in Kabul. Many living there now desperate to escape, some taking drastic measures. 9-11 is coming up and how you had uh, citizens jumping out of the towers and then you have now Afghan uh, citizens, you know, falling from the wings of a, a C-117 or a C-17. Gutierrez, like so many others, now turning to President Biden. Let us know that the soldiers that died there was not in vain. Those that lost their hands, their legs, is not in vain. Those that spilled blood there was not in vain. And when looking back on this turn of the tide. I'll say I was here explaining it to my son, that I was still proud of him. That's where I was at. And that his sacrifice was not in vain. It meant and we all thank him for that sacrifice and his family. Gutierrez also told us that his heart goes out to all of the Gold Star families watching the events in Afghanistan unfold. Let's take a quick look at the uh, traffic this evening as folks are heading home. Trouble spot here at I-37 and Loop 410 over on the south side. Uh, there is an accident there. It looks to be in the clearing stages there, but uh, folks are being pushed over there to the right side, tying up traffic just a little bit as folks try to make their way home. A big day today. 17 school districts in and around San Antonio are back in class today. And for some students, it is their first time back in a physical classroom since March of 2020. Max Massey was at Southside ISD with some new concepts for a new school year and explaining what parents should know. Yes, a new and exciting school year here at Southside ISD with a new push, STEAM Learning. We're joined here with Miss Snyder. You have all the robots, all the drones in front of you. What is this new push for STEAM learning? STEAM is the biggest thing in education right now. We're trying to give our students careers when they graduate. The goal is to have the students building apps and learning how to code things like drones so that they can have a career when they graduate high school right out of the gate. Absolutely, and you can see everything here. All of it is from students coding, whether it's with markers or on the computers. But there is a big question when it comes to mass and safety of students. 
we do see an increase in the Delta variant and we want our students and we want our faculty to, to mask up. We cannot mandate that, it's not mandatory, so it will be up to parents to decide whether their children wear masks or not. New school year, new lofty goals for Southside ISD. How do you guys look academically? It is our hope that we will be among the top 10 school districts in San Antonio, and even better, among the top three. It's a, it's a long road ahead, but we've got, uh, we've got to get our students to where they need to be in order to get them ready to do well in life. And if you guys have any questions about Southside ISD or any of the local districts, we have all those answers. Just head to KSAT.com. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a live look outside with live cam tonight. 92 degrees, some clouds out there, possibly some rain showers. Not a bad start to the uh, school year this morning at the bus stop. Pretty comfortable, but I bet those kids were a little sweaty and smelly when they came <laughs> home after playing outside for recess. Probably, Tim. You know, we started off in the low 70s. The morning low was 71. So, yeah, felt good. But outside right now, we're well into the 90s. Still cooler than seasonally average by 3 degrees, but a hot day nonetheless. Meanwhile, yesterday's rain in spots has allowed for molds to become high again in today's pollen count. So, uh, that's a little unfortunate there. We had just seen mold go down to levels that it hadn't been in a month, but right on cue, we saw that mold go back up. Now, one thing I want to talk about is there are some showers and storms on the radar. One particular storm south of Kerrville uh, in Kerr County is producing quite a bit of rain and lightning. I'll be back to take an in-depth look on our radar and we'll talk about summer showers still in our forecast in the coming days. After All right, you plan for big milestones in life like birthdays, graduations, weddings, but what about death? In these times of COVID-19's newest surge with the Delta variant, but also catastrophic accidents that could leave you unconscious or unable to communicate, do your loved ones know what your wishes are? Ursula Perry has details on how you can make sure they do. In the U.S., it's a taboo topic to talk about. Other cultures talk about dying. It's a normal thing of life. But not talking about wants and wishes for the end of life care now can lead to some big problems later. An advanced directive is a series of documents that allows a person to express their care wishes and appoint a health care proxy to make decisions on their behalf if they're unable to. But among terminally ill patients, fewer than 50 percent had advanced directives. So. What should you know about advanced directives? Well, first, include a living will to decide what medical interventions, such as resuscitation, a feeding tube, or dialysis, are acceptable. Also, states handle advanced directives differently, so you might want to consult a lawyer. And it's good to review it. Every year. Every year since advanced directives can be updated or even canceled depending on what's happening in your life. If you have an advanced directive, make sure to give a copy to your doctor and other relevant medical health care providers. It's important because a recent study shows that between 65 and 76 percent of doctors were not even aware some of their patients had an advanced directive when the time came for hard decisions many of which are happening right now in hospitals. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying high above the heart of downtown. And yes, it was a beautiful, sunny start to a new week, a new school year for a lot of people. But we know things can change very quickly, as we saw yesterday. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and yesterday's rain was a great example of the kind of rain that we're going to be expecting uh, throughout Wednesday, isolated to scattered in nature. So not everybody is going to see rain, but those that do could receive a lot of rain in a short amount of time. And that's what's happening right now up in Kerr County. Let's go ahead and take a look at the radar. This is on the Kerr and uh, Kendall County line here. Earlier, we had a storm in Rock Springs produce an inch of rain in less than 45 minutes. And this storm right now, which is working its way uh, through areas just to the west of Comfort and in Kerrville and just to the east of Comfort, it's not really moving all that much. It's practically stationary. So areas like Guadalupe Heights, Shady Grove, Center Point right now, getting a lot of heavy rain, flashes of lightning. And when you look at the rainfall rates with this, rainfall rates of up to seven inches an hour. That means that if this was to just stay still for an, in, for an hour, it could produce five to seven inches of rain. And it already has produced up to two and a half inches of rain near Shady Grove there. Just 
areas to the south and to the east of Kerrville. So again, this type of shower and storm that's occurring right now over Kerr County is a great example of the kind of rain that we'll be dealing with for the next 48 hours or so through Wednesday. All right, on the satellite imagery, some cirrus clouds are moving into Bear County from the uh, blow off of those thunderstorms up in Kerr County. So uh, we'll be having some cirrus clouds as we end the day here in San Antonio. And I still can't rule out through sunset 815 that we could see an isolated shower around the Alamo City. But that's about it. Other than that, it's going to be a quiet night. It's warm out there in spots. It's already night. It's 91 degrees in San Antonio, 92 in New Braunfels. But look at that rain cool there up in the hill country. 73 in Kerrville and 73 in Rock Springs. Meanwhile, it's almost 100 right now in Del Rio. So that's the power of a summer shower. You can get a cool down pretty quickly from uh, some thunder showers. And again, tonight only a 20% chance in San Antonio. Once the sun sets, we turn off the tap and temperatures fall into the 80s by midnight. Now, in our weather setup, there is a low pressure system that is just near El Paso right now, a trough of low pressure that's allowing for uh, some showers and storms and some energy there. In fact, these areas right here across the desert southwest are under a flash flood watch. This is going to be the source of our rain chance tomorrow. Now again, the chance for rain 30 to 40 percent, so not everybody is going to see rain, but if you do, it could uh, again, produce some very heavy rainfall. Let me take you through the future cast here. This is a look at tomorrow morning. It'll be quiet to start the day. No worries for rain on your morning commute. But as we head into the later part of the day, this is a snapshot at around dinner time. We'll start to see some thunder showers develop across the Edwards Plateau and in the hill country. And as we head into the late evening hours, those are going to be moving into parts of the northern hill country. Don't pay attention exactly to where this potential model brings the rain because this could also shift down to San Antonio or shift more up into the hill country. Just know that there's going to be a 40% chance for scattered showers and storms tomorrow in the evening hours, and those could produce some very heavy rains with localized flooding issues possible. So we'll be keeping an eye on things again starting tomorrow pretty much after 5 p.m. That's where that chance for rain is tomorrow. Other than that, though, it's going to be hot and humid for most of the day, 88 degrees, right around 94 for the high, and then we'll be watching the radar after 5 p.m. South winds at 5 to 10 miles per hour. All right, let's track the tropics because there's a lot going on in the tropics. Tropical Storm Fred made landfall at 215 in the panhandle of Florida. It's expected to fall apart across Appalachia and eventually just bringing a lot of rain to those areas. Meanwhile, we've been watching Tropical Depression Grace Ferry closely. It's still a tropical depression, but it is expected to uh, strengthen near Jamaica into a tropical storm move across the Yucatan Peninsula by Wednesday and Thursday, eventually getting into the Gulf and becoming a category one hurricane, making landfall anywhere from Veracruz all the way up to just south of Brownsville and outside of Texas. So we're going to keep an eye on it, but it is not going to impact our weather directly here in San Antonio. For us, after the chance for rain tomorrow night, Wednesday and Thursday, it's just going to be a hot weekend with highs in the mid to upper 90s. Tim, Myra. All right. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Larry, how close are we to seeing the return of Dak Prescott? Well, he is expected to practice tonight at the star with fans in the stands. So this is probably good news for the Cowboys fans as they hope Dak is ready for the regular season opener. We'll have more on Dak is back. Plus, we're going to visit with the Southwest Legacy Titans coming up. Spurs legend David Robinson on hand today to see his son Justin play in San Antonio's Summer League finale against the Thunder. Joshua Primo, Trey Jones, and Devin Vassell did not play. Second round pick Joe Wieskamp helps get the Spurs out to an early 7-2 lead with this pull-up jumper. He scored six points in the first quarter. Spurs trail 26-16 after one. Second quarter, the Admiral's son gets on the board with this land to pull San Antonio with an eight. A few minutes later, Wieskamp nails a triple and the Spurs cut the lead to three, but the Thunder pull away to go up 59-30. 37 at halftime and the Spurs fall to the Thunder 91 to 116 the closeout summer league play.
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys will resume training camp at the Ford Center at the start tonight as a transition from Oxnard to Frisco. Following a positive MRI result on his throwing shoulder, QB1 Dak Prescott is expected to practice tonight for the first time this summer. Meanwhile, Ben DiNucci is hoping to back up Dak this season. In the boys' 19-16 loss at the Cardinals Friday, DiNucci went 6 for 14 for 46 yards passing and one touchdown to Brandon Smith in the fourth quarter. Ben is getting reps this season that he didn't last year due to COVID wiping out preseason games. Any rep that I can get is positive for me. Last year I was getting maybe two or three reps a day and two of them were, were run plays and one of them was I got one pass a day so I was just trying to make the most of every opportunity but um, to have a sense of normalcy this year and to, to have guys around um, you know preseason games um, it, it's it's invaluable experience um, for me to be able to play a two quarters last week and a, and a quarter and a half this week. Um, you know that, that I just feel like um, you know it's that, that's something that we, we weren't able to do last year. So um, just just huge confidence boost for for everyone out there. Tonight is one of four practices at the Star in Frisco that will be open to fans, providing them the opportunity to see Cowboys players and coaches as they prepare for the new season. Well, let's check in with the Southwest Legacy Titans as we continue our big game coverage previews. Legacy went eight and four last season and five and one in District 14 5 8 Division One, earning their first ever trip to the playoffs, advancing to the second round. They have nine starters returning, five on offense and four on defense. Offensively, the Titans are led by quarterback Cesar Tobar, who had 1,400 passing yards last season. Defensively, the big dog is linebacker Nathan Pena, District 14 5A1 preseason defensive MVP per Dave Campbell's Texas football. Young man had 48 tackles, three tackles for loss, and three sacks last season. And head coach Robert Bruce takes over for John Tarvin, who retired in February. I'm very fortunate and very blessed to get the opportunity to coach this uh, fine group of young men. And and I, I want to try to lead him the best I can. And Coach Tarvin laid a great foundation. I want to continue that foundation that he laid and keep it going. I like having Coach Bruce. It's a, it's a little different, but it's still, we still got the same stuff going for us. We still got everyone working hard. We got leaders stepping up. It still feels great. Energy's still good. We're, everyone's still working hard. Uh, Titan football is family. It means working hard to the things we want to do and also just working hard. Robert Bruce is the brother of Brandeis football head coach Charles Bruce. The Titans will kick off the season Friday night, August 27th at home with Medina Valley at 730. The Titans are predicted to finish third in District 14 5A, one behind Southside and Southwest. Tim, I ended for football. Thank goodness. Just the way you love it. I can almost feel the mugginess through the camera shot there. It was <laughs> yeah. all fogged up a little it bit. It was, right? <laughs> a little warm this morning. Yep. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> we'll be right back. It is a big week for students all across San Antonio and Bear County heading back to the classroom for the first time, uh, sometime for the first time since March of last yeah. year amid this pandemic. All of this happening a new school year amid concerns about surging cases of the Delta variant and this is happening affecting students at all levels. We have someone from Trinity University with us here today. Tess Cootie Anders, the vice president for strategic communications and marketing at Trinity University. We talk a lot, Tess, about elementary students, middle schoolers, high schoolers. Colleges are also making some tough decisions about how to safely welcome students back on campus. So talk to us about uh, move in day, which is coming up in just a few days at the end of this week. But let's start with masking. What are the mask requirements going to be for Trinity? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're right. And it's there's some special um, this is a special situation for a college campus like ours where we're primarily residential. So we think of Trinity as sort of a small town. Uh, where people are living, working, learning, and playing together. So there's, you know, there's really no going home and getting away from it entirely at night. And so because we live in that congregate setting, we have to take some extra precautions in order to mitigate the potential for spread of the virus in our small community. Um, and so at Trinity, for example, um, we've achieved a 90% vaccination rate on our campus, which is incredible. But given the high transmission of the Delta variant in our greater community, um, we're having to take some extra behavioral steps like wearing masks indoors at all times, whether you're vaccinated or not, um, and a number of other measures intended to help us get everybody back safely, 
sort of figure out what's going on with with the, the, the virus in our population as we return and then try to stop the spread. Now, the things that you have in place for the start of school, not necessarily something that'll be in place the entire school year. You're kind of taking this on a wait and see approach. That's right. That's right. We, we hope, I think, as do many of our epidemiologists and clinicians, that um, that this surge will be will peak in mid-September and we'll able to sort of dial back some of our protocols. We think about our COVID protoc protocols as being not a light switch, but sort of on a dial or a continuum. And so what we've said is through mid-September, we're going to do some extra testing. We're going to do um, take some extra steps around the mask wearing indoors. We're going to limit large gatherings indoors um, so that we have less opportunity for this virus to get a toehold. And then once we get to about mid, we'll watch our testing and our positivity rate every week. And once we get to about mid-September, we feel we'll be able to uh, make a determination about what, if any, of those those changes or protocols continue. Let's talk about vaccinations. We've seen some universities beginning to require their students to be vaccinated for COVID. You mentioned that Trinity has a 90% vaccination rate at this point, but is a vaccine requirement something the university is looking at? You know, it's really not. Um, First of all, we're we're sensitive to um, the orders of the governor, and um, there is a, an executive order that prohibits universities like ours that accept state funds um, from mandating uh, a vaccine in order to receive services, academic services and residential services. So we're really it's really not even an option for us. That being said, we're fortunate that our community, the Trinity community, is achieved a 90% vaccination rate without a mandate, which is often we're finding better than even in some states where there are schools that can mandate the vaccine. So despite not having a mandate, our community responded and, and we're really proud of that. Will there be places on campus where students can get vaccines if they want them and uh, for testing and all of that? Absolutely. So at our, we've set up, we've expanded our health services team to include a COVID health team that is organized specifically to respond to testing, contact tracing, and treating of students. And that's left room for our traditional health services team to administer vaccines, and now to also administer booster shots, third shots of Pfizer and Moderna to those members of our community who may be immune compromised and really are you know, in need of that now. So whether you've um, only started your course of treatment and need your second shot, or you need a booster shot, or you need a first shot, we can do that on campus. We're um, providing both the Pfizer and the Janssen uh, vaccine to students, faculty, and staff. You know, this last 18 months has been a gigantic learning curve for all of us, whether it be companies or campuses. So I would imagine there are things that Trinity learned over this pandemic that you all may be implementing in this new school year. Are there any of those learning lessons that you hope to carry over? You know, I think one, the overarching lesson we've learned, whether we're talking about students, faculty or staff, is that um, COVID and all the attendant protocols and, and concerns and, and extra steps we've had to take and the distance from each other, the remoteness of what we're doing has taken a really significant toll on people mentally and emotionally. And again, that's regardless of whether you're a parent with small children, um, whether you're a student, that's that's something we're really watching carefully and looking for ways to support each other uh, because it just is not ending. And that is, um, you know, it's just whiplash. Um, so that's a big learning is just that we have to pay as much attention to our mental health and well-being as we do our physical health and safety. Real quick, we're running then, out of time. I just yeah. want to ask a question. If this third, the surge gets worse, are you guys nimble enough to be able to go to online learning if it calls for that? That was the second thing I was going to say we learned, and that is um, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't have a scramble to move to remote or hybrid learning if we had to, which is an absolute last resort. We think because of our testing, tracing, and treating protocols and our high vaccination rate, that won't be possible. That won't be a necess necessity for us. But I've also learned to be humble and never say never in this <laughs> pandemic. So we're ready if we have to be. All right. Tess Cootie Anders, thanks so much for being here. I wish you guys all the best of luck with move in on Friday and through the weekend and in the coming school year. Thank you. Be safe. Be well. Thank you.
We'll be right back. Millions of Americans will struggle with an eating disorder in their lifetime, but during the pandemic, some doctors across the U.S. are seeing this serious and sometimes deadly mental health illness in a growing number of young people. For years, doctors across the U.S. have reported a rise in eating disorders, even more so now. There definitely has been an increase during the COVID 19 pandemic. At Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, there's been a steady increase in those being treated for eating disorders from 108 hospital admissions in 2019 to 174 in 2020. So far this year, there's been 156 admissions. We think this relates to both being out of normal settings like schools and athletics and things that keep kids connected to others, as well as spending more time online and more time at home. Dr. Holly Gooding specializes in adolescent medicine. She says to be on the lookout for these common signs in your child, eating significantly less or more than they typically do, limiting or avoiding entire categories of food they once enjoyed, avoiding eating with the family or in groups, going to the bathroom or exercising immediately after eating, and significant changes in weight, whether that's an increase or decrease. She says it's also important for all parents to be good role models. Avoid talking about foods as either good or bad. Avoid talking about our own bodies as good or bad. And just avoid focusing on weight or shape in general. If you see a sign that something isn't right, Gooding says, talk to your family doctor. They can check your child's growth to see if there's been a change. Dr. Gooding says eating disorders can appear at any age. Race and gender do not matter, but the disorders that focus on body image tend to have their early onset in adolescent years, peaking between ages 12 and 16. Let's take a look outside with live cam right now. 91 degrees. This is a pretty picture. We've it got is. some nice clouds out there. Pretty blue sky. Doesn't look like any real rainmakers in this view, Sarah. Not in San Antonio. You're right, Myra. But we are seeing some healthy rain falling right now near the Kerrville area. Uh, so far today in San Antonio, we've had a day where temperatures have been cooler than seasonally average, but still warm. The high temperature was 94. Three degrees cooler than the average high this time of year. Meanwhile, it got up to 101 in Del Rio. It got up to 90 in Rock Springs, 94 in Kerrville, although temperatures in Kerrville now in the 70s because of rain cooled air. And looking ahead, we've got a couple of things to talk about. We'll talk about daily downpours in spots through the middle of the week. In the hill country, there is going to be some flooding risk. And we'll track the tropics and update for you on Tropical Depression Grace and where it is heading. More on those storms in Kerr County coming up after the break. In the buzz today, if your holiday plans include the most magical place on Earth, you're going to have to spend a bit more this year, especially if you want to attend a particular party. Guests will have to cough up, cough up nearly twice as much to attend Disney's very merriest after hours this holiday season somewhere between 169 to 229 dollars. I'll pass. It didn't even happen last year thanks to the pandemic. Disney Very Merriest After Hours runs November 8th through December 21st and requires, of course, a special ticket. The difference between the two events are a slight change in hours. If you want to go closer to Christmas, it could cost nearly $250 per person. This is Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary. Yikes. Mm -hmm. All right, if you aren't getting enough twists and turns in life, <laughs> you can always catch a theme park. Maybe that's what some thrill seekers did today for National Roller Coaster Day. August 16th commemorates the day the first looping coaster got its patent. That was all the way back in 1898. But coasters have been around longer than that. Oh, I love a good coaster. They're thought to have originated from specially constructed hills of ice called Russian Mountains in St. Petersburg that people slid down back in the 1600s. Now, of course, we've got hyper coasters, which stand over 200 feet tall, giga coasters, which re reach 300 feet, and a few specialty coasters even surpass 400 feet. Not only is it cathartic screaming on a roller coaster, <laughs> good for your health, your mental health, there may be additional benefits to riding them. Some research has shown the shaking of a coaster can help loosen kidney stones and make them easier to pass. Okay. Um, sometimes it's just well, fun to ride with your kids and scream and 
make them embarrassed. You know what? I feel like there are enough twists and turns happening in life oh, right now. I need to go for a ride is, after uh, seeing that video. It's um, it's a little bit of head on a swivel yeah. at the moment. Just, but not really with temperatures, not as far as the weather's concerned. No, we were just talking about coasters and massive 300 feet drops. Yes. Well, guys, guess what? It's all downhill from here, temperature wise, that is. In fact, today is the last day of our hottest average high temperature of 97 degrees, right? After today, we see our high temperature be a whopping 96 degrees on average, which again is a degree cooler than what the average high is right now. Now, the reason for temperatures dropping in September, other than the season changing, of course, is because we usually get cool fronts in September, at least our first average cool front in September, that has a pretty big effect on our high temperatures. And so then eventually by November, our high temperatures will be in the 70s. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Well, in some spots, temperatures are in the 70s right now because of some rain cooled air. But we do have to go all the way into the hill country to see the rain and across parts of Valverde County. Look at all of the shower and storm activity in Valverde County and just to the north there of Lake Amistad. Now, Brackettville, you'll probably get a quick splash and dash shower here from some outflow boundaries. And across parts of Kerr County, eastern Kerr County, we're just now starting to see some of this rain come to an end. But there's been steady heavy rain in Kerr and Kerr County, uh, Kerr County rather, in Kerrville uh, for the last hour or so. In fact, an aerial flood advisory in effect because in some spots, including near center point there, up to three inches of rain has fallen fallen just within the last hour or so. And this storm in Kirk County is a great example of some of the rainfall that we're going to see in areas and in spots over the next 48 hours. Now, unfortunately, it is not going to rain for everyone. I cannot promise that. But what I can say is that there are going to be some scattered showers and storms tomorrow evening and into the overnight hours that again could produce a lot of rain, mainly west and north of San Antonio. But the chance is still there. Now, Tonight in San Antonio, we're going to see temperatures fall into the low 80s by midnight, and we'll see clouds redevelop late tonight. South winds at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. Look at that temperature in Kerrville right now. 73 degrees in Kerrville from that rain cool air. Meanwhile, it's still almost 100 degrees in Del Rio uh, as we're heading into the evening hours. 99 and 92 in Gonzales and 90 in Pleasanton. We do have a heat index. It feels like 104 in Del Rio. It feels close to 100 here in San Antonio. And it feels like 100 in Gonzales. Let's take a second to track the trop to track the tropics and talk about Tropical Storm Fred. Now, Tropical Storm Fred made landfall uh, at about 2.15 this afternoon. It's expected to fall apart across the Appalachian Mountains there. And Tropical Depression Grace is expected to strengthen into a tropical storm uh, near uh, Jamaica by tomorrow afternoon and across Cancun and parts of uh, the Yucatan Peninsula by Thursday, eventually becoming a hurricane and impacting Mexico by the weekend. But here in San Antonio, we're going to focus on our chance for rain uh, tomorrow. First of all, the day will start uh, quiet, but in the afternoon, late afternoon hours, we'll be looking to the north and to the west where scattered showers and storms will develop. Most of the rain will likely occur north of Highway 90. So again, it will not rain everywhere, but if it does rain, where you are, there could be some heavy rain, which could lead to some minor uh, flooding issues, especially in the hill country, when in the overnight hours, we'll have a 40% chance for scattered showers and storms. So here's what the day looks like tomorrow. Mostly quiet, just simply hot and humid. But then after 5 p.m., that's when we'll introduce our chance for rain. South winds at 5 to 15 miles per hour. A chance for a few afternoon downpours on Wednesday and Thursday as well. They will be isolated in nature. And then no chance for rain over the weekend. It's just it's going to be hot and humid, feeling like 100 degrees on Saturday and Sunday. Downhill from here. Downhill from here. Keep I that in mind. I'm ready for the downhill. <laughs> <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Those being Seguin ISD, whose superintendent says this school year will look similar to 2019. But there will not be a vaccine mandate at Seguin ISD's campuses, and while students and staff will be encouraged to wear masks, it will not be a requirement. The district superintendent, Dr. Matthew Gutierrez, says that decision will be left with parents. 
as hospitals in the southern states bear the brunt of the Delta variant. Please send help now. The U.S. now trending in the same direction of last year's winter surge. In Houston, Texas, nearly 600 patients waiting for hospital beds, 87 for ICU beds. In the shooting at a sports bar on Sunday that left three people dead, two others injured. This man, 34-year-old Daniel Berrigan, was arrested earlier today. He's charged with three counts of capital murder. Berrigan walked in front of our cameras just a short while ago. That shooting happened just before 3.30 in the morning on Sunday at Boom Boom Sports Bar on South New Braunfels Avenue near I-10. He's responding to a shots fired call at an apartment complex around noon after a man sleeping with his gun. That gun went off hitting a woman in the head. That's the story anyway. The incident happened at Oak Springs Apartments on Perrin Central Boulevard. That's according to SAPD. A 20 year old man sleeping with a pistol when it went off, going through the door of the apartment next door, hitting a 24 year old woman in the head. The woman was taken to Samsey. She is expected to be OK in all of this. No word on if that man will face charges. <laughs> That is all our time for now. Thanks so much for watching the news at six. Have a good evening. We'll see you back here for the night beat tonight at 10. Steve Spreester will be back for that.